Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 12358 in the name of Liz Smith on education subject choices. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Liz Smith to speak and move the motion. Ms Smith, eight minutes or thereabouts, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, few decisions are more important to any young person at school than those that they make about subject choice. What they decide defines their future career, and that is why the Scottish Conservatives, like many parents, teachers and young people across Scotland, have become increasingly concerned about the evidence which points to the fact that the range of choices at S4 level in many schools is now restricted. Not only does this impact most on S4 and S5 pupils who will leave school with only a NAT4 qualification or NAT5 qualification, but also on the choice opportunities that they have within higher and advanced higher courses in S5 and S6, with the obvious implications for further entry later on. Now, if I want, if I want me, I want to set out the evidence. I want to place the evidence in the context of what was supposed to happen in the Curriculum for Excellence, and I want to put proposals on the table as what to has, has to happen to address the problem. In terms of setting out the evidence, I'm going to draw upon the work of Professor Jim Scott, the evidence that was presented to the Education and Schools Committee in 2016-17 by teachers, local authorities and the education agencies, the work of Glasgow Caledonian University, Reform Scotland, the Scottish Government's own research within its annual statistical reports and various articles within the media over the last two years. All of them, all of them without exception, are pointing to the increasing movement away from eight subjects in S4 to six. In 2013, 28% of schools had moved to six subjects. In 2016, that was 47%. And Professor Scott's latest research shows the figure is now 57%. And Professor Scott's evidence also goes on to show that there has been a corresponding decline in S4 enrolments and S4 attainment in SQA levels three to five. He acknowledges that SQ, SQA has made 3,750 more awards per year as a result of diversifying the type of certificate course, but he points to the loss of no fewer than 143,735 annual course passes as a result of the decline in subject choice from eight to six. Deputy Presiding Officer, the real issue here is for S4 pupils who are entered for NAT4 and NAT5 courses, but who want to leave school at the end of the fourth year or the fifth year, because they are going to be leaving school with fewer qualifications than would otherwise have been the case. Now, to place all of this in context, there is a very important to be, debate to be had about the delivery of the curriculum for elections. There was a relatively powerful argument in principle that schools should be more free to develop their own curriculum so that it best suits the needs of their pupils. There was also the argument that learning in depth is more important than learning in breadth. And it is not fair to contrast what is happening now with the curriculum for excellence with what went before. Now, I can accept some of these arguments, but what I cannot accept, and neither can young people and parents, is what has happened in practice, perhaps with unintended consequences. And that is the narrowing of subject choice, not just in S4, but in S5 and in S6, and how this has had a particularly marked effect on many young people attending schools in disadvantaged communities, something about which we should all be concerned for widening access. In March 2017, Glasgow Caledonian University's research concluded that many people, and I quote, many people struggle to get their preferred choice in S5 and S6, and that many people don't get the opportunity to be able to sit higher across a two-year period so that there is better scope for articulation. So let me deal with the arguments that I'm sure will be put to us by the Scottish Government. The line given to us by the First Minister when she's been challenged on this issue is that more young people than ever before are achieving a higher and advanced higher passes. No one is disputing that, and it's good. But that not, must not just become a quantitative argument. Drill down, and there are many different perspectives which tell us that in qualitative terms, that's not quite the picture. For example, there has been a very significant squeeze on modern languages, a key skill which most employers value very highly. And there is also some evidence that there is now a squeeze on STEM subjects, also a key skill highly valued by employers. 
because the fall in subject choice from eight to six subjects inevitably makes it more difficult for young people to have the best possible combinations, a point that was noted by University of Scotland when it provided its evidence to the Education and Skills Committee last year. Secondly, we are told that we must not look at the individual years, but at, at the senior phase as a three-year progression. Now, in theory, I could accept that. But in practice, the narrowing of subject choice in S4 is beginning to have a similar effect on S5 and S6. Because if there was a properly thought out progression, we would not see the reluctance to offer young people the chance to sit higher across two academic years. We would not see the two term dash to higher and we would not say, see the very serious situation affecting advanced hire. And I raise this point about the advanced hire, not just because it is seen as Scotland's most prestigious exam and envied by many educationalists in other jurisdictions, and because it's actually in more in tune with the founding principles of Curriculum for Excellence than any other exam, but because it draws into question the purpose of the S6 year. How ironic is it that the Russell Group of Universities south of the border are stronger advocates of the advanced hire than many people in Scotland. Now, on this side of the chamber, we believe it's a very important question to answer, not least because more pupils want to stay on at school until they're 18, and therefore they ought to be able to access advanced hire as they want. But that is not the case just now, and most especially in the disadvantaged communities. As the widening access debate progresses, more and more people believe that the focus of that policy has to be on schools including the early years, but not so much on the artificial targets within colleges and universities. Widening the availability of advanced hire must surely be part of that focus and ensuring that we do not end up with statistics which show that just two secondary schools in disadvantaged areas offer more than 12 advanced hires, while 27% of schools can do that in a more affluent area. Now, I know there are some very successful developments happening in hubs, uh, arranged by Glasgow University, Dundee University and Aberdeen University. And they're all working to make more advanced hires more available. But that does not help many, many young people in Scotland, particularly those who are unable to travel to the hub. So what must be done, Deputy Presiding Officer? Firstly, it is imperative that we address the S4, uh, sorry, the S1 to S4 curriculum. We've ended up with no clear strategy and vision for the middle years, which means that when it comes to S4, we have to condition people down to far fewer subjects. That articulation we have lost in the early years. But can I just say, and can I finish on this point, that a key part of this is about teacher numbers. We cannot hope to have effective subject choice if we have 3,400 fewer teachers in the system than we did when the SNP came to power. Nor can we hope to improve things if there is a serious shortage in core subjects like maths, if there is an increasing trend for experienced teachers to leave the profession. Deputy Presiding Officer, this is a hugely significant issue. This is a very important subject for many children across Scotland. At the moment, they are not getting a fair choice. Hence the reason why I move the motion in my name. Thank you. I call on John Swinney to speak to and move Amendment 12358.4, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, uh, I welcome this afternoon's debate and I want to try to be as helpful as I can in discussing the substantive issues that are raised by Liz Smith today. Um, the reason for that is that this whole debate was a key focus of the national debate that informed the development of Curriculum for Excellence with the decisions that were taken endorsed across the education and skills system and very widely supported within this parliamentary chamber. One of the central aspects of the reform of Curriculum for Excellence was the extension of the broad general education to the end of S3, which was a point which I felt was not given justice by the speech that Liz Smith has just, has just given. Because the extension of the broad general education to the end of S3 was a fundamental feature of the design of the new curriculum. Learners now study a wider range of subjects and to a higher level with a greater degree of deeper learning than under the previous curriculum. And we cannot just skate past that. The benchmarks signed off by the Chief Inspector in 2016 
endorsed also by the Chief Examiner of uh, Qualifications in the Scottish Qualifications Authority, provide the clarity and the evidence of the higher standards that are expected at each level of the curriculum for excellence and particularly at the conclusion of the broad general education at the conclusion of S3. Uh, of course. Liz Smith. Giving way on that point. If that's correct, Cabinet Secretary, there ought to be a good progression into S4. But at the moment, what's happening is that pupils are doing a considerable number of subjects in breadth in S1 to S3, and they're being conditioned, they're being restricted in S4 at the very time where they're wanting to take qualifications. Well, well, that, that, that essentially brings me on to the, the other substantive point that I want to make, that the focus on the breadth of learning throughout the primary school and the first years of secondary school ensure that learners have a solid foundation on which to enter the senior phase of school. And I want to highlight three particular features of the senior phase that are relevant to this debate. The first is that the period from S4 to S6, and this addresses directly the compartmentalisation point that Liz Smith is making around S4, is designed as a three-year phase of learning, where the focus is on a learner's total achievements by the end of that period, rather than an individual year-on-year -year attainment. The second point, and the second objective of the reform, was to maximise the richness of the learning throughout the senior phase, focusing on the best way to allow learners to achieve the highest possible level of attainment. This approach recognises that whilst qualifications are undoubtedly important in allowing young people to pursue their aspirations, there is little value in simply accumulating qualifications at lower levels for their own state. If Mr Mundell will forgive me, I've got quite a lot of ground to cover. This may well mean that learners take fewer subjects in S4 than under the previous system, where the focus was on gaining as many standard grades or O levels as possible. But far from this being an unintended consequence, that was an entirely deliberate outcome of redesigning the senior phase. And in the evidence that Terry Lanigan gave to the Education and Skills Committee in January 2017, <coughs> Uh, many of these points were made about how the structuring of the curriculum had been undertaken to reflect the fact that young people were, were being encouraged to engage in deeper learning that enabled them to fulfil their potential as a consequence of that point. Certainly. Liz Smith. Secretary, satisfied that those uh, students in S4 are getting a fair deal when it comes to subject choice? Well, that will be a, a judgment arrived at in individual schools based on the curriculum model that individual schools want to take forward. And that's, that's the policy position that I bring to this debate, that I believe schools should be able to undertake the curriculum model design that best meets the needs of learners within their individual schools, recognising the strategic guidance given to the education system that the S4 to S6 um, experience must be viewed as a three-year experience, not compartmentalised into individual annual components, which is what the Conservatives would seek to get us through. I'll give way to Ms. Oliver Mundell. At a very basic level, President Officer, I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would accept that if pupils drop a subject because they're unable to take it in S4, it makes it less likely that they're going to take it up again in S5 or S6? Cabinet Secretary. Well, not necessarily, because young people will have because young people will have established stronger foundations in a higher and more demanding broad general education than would have been the case in the previous uh, arrangements. The third point was the determination to focus not solely on traditional attainment, but to recognise the range of other experiences and skills that young people need to make a success of their lives in a fast-changing world. This approach has embed been embedded further by the successful implementation of the Developing Scotland's Young Workforce Programme. This, of course, results in... Uh, I'll have to make some more progress. Jenny this results, of oh, course... No, I, well, I, I, I'll unless, give you the time back. In OK, that, I'll yes. with Gemma. Jenny Mara, sorry, I preempted you. I there. thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. He suggested that these decisions about um, course choice are available on a school-by-school -school basis. But Dundee City Council, Council's curriculum guidelines say that pupils can study a maximum of six subjects at NAT 4 and 5. That's for the whole local authority. Does he accept that these policies are being made on a local authority basis and not on an individual school basis? As 
Cabinet Secretary. Secretary. Well, you see, this, this gets us to the nub of the reform agenda that I'm interested in taking forward. And I'm glad that Ms Mara is a supporter of the reform agenda that I'm taking forward, because I do believe these decisions should be undertaken at school level, enabling schools to put in place the curriculum that meets the needs of individual young people. So the approach that the, uh, the, the product of the approaches that we have taken have been to see a significant increase in the positive destinations that are being achieved by young people. And this is the point the First Minister made at First Minister's question time yesterday. It's resulted in the, an increase in the number of higher passes exceeding 150,000 for each of the last three years, recognising the significance and the value of that qualification. And it also results in nearly 60,000 skill-based awards and achievements which recognise the learning that has been undertaken by young people and identifying the value of that within the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework for young people in the further destinations that they take forward. I want also, Presiding Officer, to reflect on the fact that the models for uh, delivery of education in Scotland are more diverse today than they were when we were talking about O grades and standard grades. We now have, for the advanced hire, hosting arrangements involving, the, uh, for example, the Gl uh, Glasgow Caledonian University, the Virtual School Network in Highland Council, the East School in the Western Isles, which is enabling a much broader range of advanced hires to be available to a broader range of young people in their different educational settings. So in this debate, presiding officer, there will be a, a lot of information and, a, and, 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 and discussion about what are the right choices to be made. I believe that the fundamental choices made in constructing curriculum for excellence, which identified two three-year phases in the secondary sector, which enabled young people to focus on the outcomes that they achieved and for our educationists to focus on the outcomes that they achieve, are exactly the right approaches to take and are the foundations for the learner journey work that the Higher Education Minister will talk about in her conclusions to this debate, which serve the young people of Scotland very well in the foreseeable future. I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say I'm running out of spare time, but I thought it was important to allow interventions that were in you know, direct questions, so bear that in mind as we go on. Ian Gray, please. Thank you very to much, Presiding to, Officer. I haven't, I haven't said what you're doing yet. Oh, sorry. To speak to move Amendment 12358.1, just in case you'd forgotten. Thank you. I hadn't forgotten, and I do indeed rise to move the amendment uh, in my name. Uh, this is an important issue, but it's not a new one. The narrowing of the curriculum and fall in attainment in S4 was raised by Kezia Dugdale in May 2015 at First Minister's Questions, and again in June of that year. And the evidence meticulously gathered from official sources, collated and analysed by Jim Scott, was there even then. But the First Minister chose not to listen. She tried to suggest that Professor Scott didn't know the difference between enrolments and pupil numbers. She wrote the whole thing off as constant SNP bashing. But it wasn't. And three years on, the evidence for the narrowing of the curriculum in our schools has mounted. The number of schools allowing pupils to study more than six subjects in S4 uh, has indeed fallen to 43%, and only 11% now allow eight subjects. The numbers are stark, but so are the consequences. That narrowing of the curriculum is pushing some subjects out of schools altogether, and nothing is going to convince me that that was an intended consequence of the great education debate or curriculum for excellence. And as uh, Ms Smith said, <coughs> modern languages are particularly badly affected. It's no coincidence that last year, the number of young people gaining any language qualification was 50% lower than in 2007. And Gaelic, to which we all in here committed our support only a couple of weeks ago, was exactly one of the subjects Dr Scott identified years ago as being at risk. This time, the Education Secretary counters with an amendment of positive statistics, which are true, but hide rather than contradict the problem. With regard to hires, yes, high achieving pupils who are going to do five or six hires will still do five or six hires. The point is that they will be choosing those hires from a narrower S4 base, and their chances of doing three sciences or two modern languages 
<coughs> are being undermined or even denied in some schools with a knock-on effect into university course choice. And as uh, for the rather the, the statistic in the government amendment, the rather contrived faster increase in lower income pupils gaining at least one qualification at level four, five or six. Well, that's true, but it is largely driven by more of the wealthier end of that statistic moving on to level seven qualifications. The number of exam passes by pupils in S4, as has already been pointed out, has fallen by over 140,000 since the new exams were introduced. The number of National 5 entries per learner has declined by 20%. The pass rate for National 5s has fallen from 91.3% in 2013 to 79.5% now. So those who leave school with only National 4 and 5 qualifications can choose and set fewer subjects and they are achieving fewer passes. Indeed, the very same SQA tables from which Mr Swinney's figure is derived show that since 2013, the percentage of pupils leaving school with no qualification at all is rising, especially in lower income deciles. It's not a big rise, but it is the reversal of a 50 year historical trend. Comprehensive schools, awards for all, standard grades, those took a school system which left 70% with nothing and turned it into one we could be proud of where every pupil's achievement was recognised. These are achievements that matter too. S4 leavers deserve the best from our schools as much as the high flyers with their higher pass rates. Now, no one is arguing that there's a conspiracy here, but there are unintended consequences of the new exams coupled with teacher shortages and tight budgets. And the Education Secretary simply has to face up to it. And these consequences are impacting on those at the wrong end of the attainment gap. And parents don't understand what's going on. They don't understand why their children's choice is so constrained. And they don't understand why that choice depends so heavily on which school they use. Even in my own constituency, where there are as few as five high schools, some offer six, some offer seven, and some offer eight subjects. And you S4. must conclude with a sentence, I'm sorry. Parents feel that pupils from more affluent communities have been offered more choice and more chances. And Cabinet Secretary, that can only exacerbate the attainment gap. It's not enough to just accept the motion tonight. We have to hear what you're going to do to fix this problem. Yes, I'm sorry, in these short debates, time is very, very tight. It's now tight four minutes for all speeches. I call Ross Greer. Ross Greer, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Ensuring that Scotland schools provide an inclusive learning environment for all young people to excel is an obvious point of consensus, and subject choice cuts right to the heart of that issue. How can we expect young people from more deprived communities in particular to succeed if they're not given the same opportunity to choose the subjects that they want, or indeed the subjects that they need? Of course attainment will be lower if pupils are restricted to subjects that they have less interest in. And this restricted choice can have a lifelong impact. Whether it's a missed opportunity to develop an interest from an early age or a knock-on effect in career or future study choices. One of the benefits of the Scottish education system should be that our senior phase provides for a wide education, rather than shoehorning pupils towards three A levels as down south. But with restricted subject choice, that diverse education isn't being delivered. Young people are not being given the same opportunities to develop their own interests. Tackling the poverty-related attainment gap means ensuring that all pupils have a good choice of subjects at all levels, national four and five, higher, advanced higher, and others. But we're not doing that when in Glasgow, for example, pupils from the most deprived communities will on average be offered six fewer hires than those from the least deprived. This is an immediate inequality, but also one with profound long-term effects. And some parts of Scotland face far greater difficulties when it comes to subject choice. Across our rural and island communities, for example, it is obviously simply not possible for individual schools to have the same breadth of expertise within the building as in areas of larger, denser population but that should not prevent the full breadth of subjects being offered to young people in these communities. The reality is it does though. Distance learning, using the internet, teleconferencing, can allow pupils to learn subjects that are not physically available within their own school. These options are already used across Scotland, though not with consistency and with unnecessary barriers remaining. 
different approaches to timetabling, for example, within local authorities can create difficulties. This is an issue where we need to grapple with the difference between granting autonomy to individual schools and head teachers and the kind of coordination required, particularly across rural communities. These are barriers that do need to be addressed. But for the most part, it is teacher shortages that have had a severe impact on subject choice in particular communities and with particular subjects. We've now debated the causes of these shortages on a number of occasions, including through the inquiry process of the Education Committee. We know that issues of workload, conditions and pay have had a major impact on both recruitment and retention, particularly in subject areas where those with a relevant qualification have clear alternative employment in the private sector. And we know that austerity cuts are at the core of much of this. Real term spending in education has dropped by £335 million since 2007. It's about 6.5 per cent. Many local councils did sought to protect education spending after their budgets were squeezed. But that very quickly became close to impossible when the squeeze started almost a decade or over a decade ago. The Scottish Government would like to highlight the Attainment Challenge Fund and the Pupil Equity Fund as investments in education. And while all new uh, money into education is welcome, as we discussed with the Cabinet Secretary this morning, in many cases, this is simply being used to plug gaps left by core budget cuts. And given the annual nature of the funding and restrictions on how it's spent, it's obviously not resolving the issue of subject choice when restrictions are caused by staffing shortages. Core council education budgets are where funding needs to go and where we can begin to resolve some of the issues around subject choice restrictions. We can see the impact of the last decade's budget decisions on teachers. There are 3,500 fewer teachers than there were in 2007. It's not difficult to understand when their wages are 20% lower in real terms than they were 10 years ago. And all the fast track schemes that we can think of won't solve that problem. A genuinely restorative pay rise is what's required there. The EIS have launched their campaign for that restorative rise, starting with 10% this year. And I sincerely hope that the government takes this pay claim seriously in negotiations. Well, it wouldn't resolve all of the issues which are affecting subject choice as Liz Gray, uh, apologies, Liz Smith and Ian Gray uh, laid out. It would go a long way uh, on some of the, the major uh, underlying issues. I think I'll rescue you there. It's time to sit down. Uh, <laughs> I now call, now call Tavish Scott. Mr Scott, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. This uh, uh, debate that... Uh, uh, Liz Smith has brought forward today is about uh, subject choice and actually uh, I, in some ways I speak more as a father than as an MSP on this one because my uh, oldest children have been through uh, that subject uh, choice and I think this is actually uh, very simple it's not the government's fault I, I think um, Liz and Ian Gray were quite right about Liz Smith and Ian Gray were quite right about this I think the government should take this as as a sign that we're all looking for a, a more considered way forward I think to rest on curriculum for excellence uh, those of us who sat through the education committee evidence in the last two or three years and in fairness to Mr Swinney he's very well aware of this very concerned about the implementation of that programme and how it was actually uh, done. So the unintended consequences that Ian Gray uh, rightly highlighted, much of which came out of, uh, shall we say, a less than perfect implementation of uh, that, not least of which by Education Scotland. If there's one major truck I'd have with, uh, with the government on this, it, seems, it always it does seem and remains strange to me that we have rewarded the one body responsible for the Curriculum for Excellence implementation, Education Scotland, with more powers uh, rather than asking some fundamental questions about their role, a, a role uh, not least of which pointed out by OECD amongst others, which Mr Swinney in fairness is uh, very keen to uh, point out to us. So I hope the government will take this debate in that spirit, that this is about uh, seeking to find some solutions to this narrowing of choice. And here's why uh, it matters, um, because if you are at uh, S4 and you are given that choice that is only six, as is all too prevalent from the figures that, uh, that uh, members across the chamber have already mentioned, uh, you simply do not have, by definition, so much choice uh, at a uh, higher level at S5. Uh, and that matters, because like it or lump it, I have yet to find a university who doesn't want uh, my son or my daughter or any Scottish pupil to make those hires at one sitting. So I entirely take John Swinney's point about the senior phase, but that is not the reality, rightly or wrongly, it's not the reality of how our higher education uh, sector is then approaching uh, their assessment of candidates uh, for their uh, universities. And that's happening today. I mean, uh, I can't be the only parent who pushed the trolley down the supermarket aisle this weekend at home in Lerwick and got it in the ear from a couple of parents uh, about uh, a university not taking uh, their son because uh, he had not got what he needed to, uh, to get. Uh, and the reasons for that, they considered, were also about the narrowing of choice. Now, I should quickly add, the Anderson High School in Lerwick uh, has offered seven. Uh, they were told and I rem well remember seeing the emails about this, they were told when Education Scotland were pushing the senior phase that they should only offer six, but the 
Head teacher and her, and her promoted team made it very clear that their school strongly believed in seven and they were going to continue uh, to do that. And that, in my view, is the right thing uh, to do. So I believe the, uh, the, the central core of this, of this subject choice uh, argument is very important and very powerful. If the university sector uh, changed their approach to one where they accepted the uh, government's arguments that uh, the cabinet secretary has forwarded this, this afternoon, that they should consider that across the piece of the, of the senior phase, then we'd be we'd be discussing and debating this in a different way but that's not uh, the reality and that's the reason why uh, the the unintended consequence that has been described this evening does need to be addressed and I do hope the government therefore take Dr Jim Scott's uh, evidence as something that does need uh, active consideration and active uh, work it's interesting also to note from Spice the government accept they don't have their own figures in this area indeed I asked this morning what uh, information was held and uh, I was told that no data on school curricula models uh, was available and therefore on subject availability and I think therefore Dr Scott deserves some credit uh, for bringing this information into the public domain and giving the government a reason for addressing the very issue that uh, Liz Smith has brought to us this afternoon. One final point, uh, presiding officer, on, on developing Scotland's young work workforce, I would entirely agree with uh, the Cabinet Secretary's remarks. Uh, I would simply ask him to look uh, anew at ensuring there is a wider accreditation of non-formal education, youth awards and courses, which could help the very people who we need to deal with in uh, closing that educational attainment gap. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate. Speeches of a type four minutes. James, Jamie Halker-Johnson, followed by Claire Adams. Mr Halker-Johnson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, I'd like to welcome the remarks of my colleague Liz Smith. She outlined in great detail in her speech the reason this debate is an important one. On these benches, we have sought answers from the Scottish Government over the last week on the significant change in schools, the narrowing of the subject choice. Indeed, we are told the Curriculum for Excellence will provide more choices and more chances for young people. We are assured that Curriculum for Excellence would not mean a restriction in subject choice. However, that choice has been restricted. The points that appear in our motion today were, of course, put to the First Minister on Thursday. In a response, she said, what matters is the qualification that pupils leave school with, not just the subjects that they study in S4. We cannot be alone in sharing concerns at the complacency of that answer. Ruth Davidson asked about apples she was told the important thing was oranges. Subject choice, it seems, doesn't matter much. However, when we have leading educationalists telling us that social inequalities in entry to Scotland are mostly explained by subject choice, and when we have a range of experts in the field of education telling us that the many problems that this is building up, it becomes time to take notice. One of the traditional positives of the examination structure in Scotland was the supposed breadth of learning that it provided. Specialization in particular subjects was gradual, giving school leavers both a broader education and a greater degree of choice as they moved into higher level qualifications. The Deputy First Minister's response has been to assert that the senior phase in secondary schools is a three year progression. But this seems to take no notice of the impact on young people who take a different course. Again, Liz Smith mentioned the squeeze on certain subjects, highlighting particularly the concerns surrounding modern languages and STEM subjects. Between 2014 and 2017, SQA reported the number of entrants to higher French fell by 6%. For higher German, the fall is 12%. With a focus on language tuition, these numbers should be extremely concerning for ministers. In terms of STEM education, where the Scottish Government has a focus, we can look to similar falls across three main sciences and a significant decline in entrance to higher maths. The qualifications gained at secondary level are important and valuable in themselves but we should not turn a blind eye to the restrictiveness this places on young people who are looking towards their futures. For those contemplating a vocational route to enter a modern apprenticeship or otherwise move into work, restricted subject choice obviously does have an impact. Since Curriculum for Excellence came into play, the SQA has revealed that the number of exam passes by pupils in S4 has fallen by 150,000. And straying into the new foundation apprenticeships which are on offer through schools, I've spoken previously in this chamber about the variability of framework choice across different parts of Scotland. In my own region, the Highlands and Islands, there have been as few as two frameworks offered to young people. The Minister, J.B. Hepburn, was helpfully clear in his intention to broaden out availability across local authorities. And universities too have noted that this restrictive subject choices, as restricted cho subject choices have an impact on entry. And the University of Edinburgh acknowledged that this is causing damaging exclusion for young people from less advantaged backgrounds. There is a debate to be had on how specific the choices, uh, to people relative, uh, choices given to people relatively early on in their secondary, secondary education should be. 
When young people are restricted to a smaller number of subjects, it continues to impact their choices later on in education. Presiding officer, the shortcomings in our, in our education system always seem to have a dispro disproportionate impact on the least advantaged young people. Curriculum for Excellence was introduced with great fanfare. fanfare. The Scottish Government uh, and gained wide support on the basis of assurances and positions presented by ministers. Unfortunately, in the case of subject choice, it seems that these assurances have not been kept. Claire Adamson, followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I said I am somewhat dismayed at um, some of the arguments that are being used in the chamber this afternoon. I served on the Education and Culture Committee in S4 term of the Parliament. And many of what has been discussed today was raised in evidence at that time. Indeed, uh, in 2012, Ken Muir of Education Scotland, in response to questions by Liz Smith herself, said, the expectation is that youngsters will, in the main, experience a broad general education up to the end of S3, or at least will have an opportunity to receive the experiences and outcomes up to the third curriculum level. And he went on to say, the new system is not about going for eight or nine qualifications in one year. It's a continuum of learning. Those are not just words. The new qualifications will and do build on experiences, outcomes of broad general education. I'm sorry, I don't have time. Um, the, well, uh, if the Conservatives wanted a proper debate, they might have given more debate time over this afternoon to the subject. The two... <laughs> No, Ken Muir also said that the 2 plus 2 versus 3 plus 3 issue is a false dichotomy. Broad general education goes up to S3, and that does not mean that there is no choice before that stage. Indeed, personalisation and choice are an entitlement of curriculum for excellence. President officer, that was 2012. And again in that year, um, uh, Terry Lanigan of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland said one of the weaknesses in the current system is the well-known two-term dash to hires. The new system will allow the most able young people to start two-year hire courses at the beginning of S4. And the other myth that has grown up is the idea that those schools that choose to present some or all pupils for eight qualifications in S4 are somehow doing better than those that adopt another model. The whole point of Curriculum for Excellence is to ensure that the needs of the individual young person are addressed and that each young person gets the chance to attain qualifications at whichever point is appropriate for their needs. This was the whole reason behind Curriculum for Excellence, making it pupil-based, making it pupil-focused and allowing pupils to um, advance at an appropriate speed and appropriate time for their own areas. Can I also go back to 2014 when we were discussing this and uh, Larry Fl Flanagan of Education Institute of Scotland talking about the implementation of curriculum for excellence said at the end of all this if all we have done is replace the exams and we have not changed the pedagogical approach in schools or whatever year youngsters make their future choices we will not have achieved Curriculum for Excellence. Curriculum for Excellence is about giving teachers, giving individual schools the opportunities to design the courses and design the, the plans for the young people to ensure that the best outcomes for those young people. Larry Flanagan also went on to talk about the 160 hours that are required for SQA um, qualifications. So if you've got a maths head of the department, he will want those 160 hours. How on earth do you timetable 160 hour um, uh, courses um, without t squeezing teaching and learning of young people to, if, if you're going to ask them to do more than that. So you can maintain six or seven or even eight choices for young people, but that's not in one year. That's over the final phase of curriculum for excellent and the final phase of that implementation. So um, if I could just finish on a, a, an anecdote, there's been a few of those this afternoon. My own son did advanced hire um, music. He's now studying music at the University of West of Scotland. He didn't do it at his school. He did it in a cluster because his school couldn't do the advanced hire, but he got on the bus, went to the other school, and he got to get the choices he wanted. And a lot of what's been talked about this afternoon doesn't take into consideration the way schools work together. Jenny Mara, followed by Richard Lockhead. <clears throat> Presiding officer, uh, excuse me, could we stop the private conversation across benches, please? Jenny Mara. Presiding officer, um, 
it comes as a surprise to no one, and certainly not to me, that the limited choices that the motion outlines today are the case in Dundee. I understand, and quoted from a policy paper to the Cabinet Secretary there, that Dundee City Council's policy is for pupils to study a maximum of six subjects at National 4 and 5 in, S in S4, and up to five hires and advanced hires in S5 and 6. So yes, it is equal across our city, but the policy has been used to limit choice for everyone in the city in all eight secondary schools. And Cabinet Secretary, at higher level, we only have two out of those eight secondary schools in the city that are hitting their target for the number of higher passes that they are expected to achieve. And that's with deprivation factored in. And we find that locally, a couple of schools previously considered two of the highest achieving or performing schools in the city fall well below beneath their benchmark expected figure of higher passes. I feel so strongly that that is not good enough for the children that are going through education at the moment. And I'm sure that a number of parents locally agree with me. We have a duty, presiding officer, to look carefully at exactly what is happening. At lunchtime today, Bill Bowman and I spoke to Primary 6 from Fintry Primary School in Dundee. In a year's time, they will go to Braveview Academy. 12% of pupils at Braveview achieve five or more hires. And their benchmark figure with deprivation factored in by the Scottish Government is 27%. So less than half of the pupils that should be achieving five hires or more are being allowed to fulfil their potential. So for that lovely class of bright-eyed, enthusiastic primary sixes, the restriction in subject choice is a problem as it will hit them the hardest, as Ian Gray outlined. The attainment gap for them is real and is going to hit them in three, um, is hitting them now, but it's going to hit them in the terms of the motion today in three or four years. And the cuts to teachers in our schools for them is a reality. But, presiding officer, if you'll allow me, this week we have seen the storm brew in Dundee over pupil equity funding. We learnt at the start of the week that swimming lessons for primary school pupils across Dundee have been withdrawn, something I will raise directly with the First Minister tomorrow. Targeted Scottish Government funding of £200,000 for the top-up swimming programme came to an end and has never been replaced. That came to an end in 2015. Dundee City Council said in response, and I quote, Head teachers have been given the opportunity to explore how swimming lessons can be delivered through the Pupil Equity Fund and Leisure and Culture's Family Swimming Initiative. So it seems head teachers can raid the Pupil Equity Funding pot or parents can pay for the lessons themselves. Now, Pupil Equity Funding was trumpeted by John Swinney as extra cash for schools in deprived areas to spend as they know best to close that attainment gap. But the, no, I don't have time. She's just the closing. The SNP Council is now no. telling head teachers to spend this money to replace services that used to be provided centrally. They are being asked to use the pupil equity funding to mitigate the cuts. But I heard this morning in the Education Committee that John Swinney said that the SNP Council in Dundee are wrong to do this. Can he perhaps clarify? No, Miss Mara, you're closing. For this afternoon because I don't know how he expects the pupil equity funding not to be spent on mitigating the cuts when he cut 12 million from Dundee City Council's budget. Richard Lockhead followed by Alison Harris. Thank you very much. I think it's probably worth saying at the outset that I firmly believe that you can't just measure a pupil's success by the number of hires they have in their hand when they leave school or indeed the school success in educating children by the number of qualifications the children have when they leave school either. I think they're very important factors, but we shouldn't dwell on those alone in determining the success of individuals or indeed our education system. Uh, Liz Smith closed her speech by talking about what she felt was one of the underlying
causes of the lack of subject choice in some schools in Scotland, which was teacher numbers and teacher shortages. And I really want to focus on that for my uh, short speech, because clearly uh, this is an issue in terms of teacher numbers that affects many parts of Scotland at the moment, particularly some rural parts of Scotland. Uh, the Murray, which I represent, of course, I've been involved in that issue for the last few years. The issue, of course, is that it's not a question of cash. The money is there. So we keep calling about resources and more money. In the case of where we do have some of our teacher shortages, it's not about money. The money is there. People are simply not applying for the jobs in some of our more rural areas, in particular uh, of Scotland. And that does put pressures on the schools, particularly at primary level, where the head teachers and deputy head teachers have to help out in the classroom. And it takes focus away sometimes from the leadership role at the same time. And in some secondary schools, of course, it can mean there's not enough subject choices perhaps one would like. However, there is enough to give people a good education, and that's what matters at the end of the day. And it's not just, of course, teachers that many rural areas are struggling to attract. It's other professionals and other occupations as well. And we do need to research as a government, as a parliament, into why uh, people are not applying to work in rural areas when it comes to some of those more professional jobs. And, of course, it's not just Scotland. Uh, also, these are issues in England. And I see the uh, English Education Secretary was speaking to uh, English teachers uh, just recently in Birmingham, where he said, I recognise that recruitment and retention is difficult for schools, and one of the biggest threats to this is workload. So it's also an issue in England. And, of course, the Education Committee, which I sit on, just recently visited Finland and Sweden to discuss their education system. And what we heard from the Swedish uh, uh, educationalists we spoke to was that teacher recruitment is a big issue in Sweden as well, and they're projecting teacher shortages in the years ahead. So it's not just Murray, it's not just Scotland, <laughs> it's England, it's Sweden, and it's many other places in Western Europe as well. We have to research uh, why that uh, is the case. There are some measures that are being taken, of course, that are very important, uh, and I do welcome the Cabinet Secretary's intervention to lead to more homegrown teachers in our local communities. In the Highlands, the north of Scotland, of course, that means working with the University of Highlands and Islands, where there are some good initiatives underway to help retrain people from other careers to become teachers or help people just to train locally as teachers. And that's now beginning to make a difference. So there are things we can do. There are also things, of course, the UK government can do, working with Scottish authorities, and maybe the Conservatives can look into this as well, which is dealing with our immigration situation, where it's very difficult for teachers who are sometimes married to Scots, who sometimes have jobs in schools, to get their visas to actually fulfil their job and work in those schools and for, uh, plug those vacancies. Uh, I would perhaps would suggest to the Cabinet Secretary, I'm not sure if there's anything else the government can do in terms of sponsoring visas. I know there are some issues in some local authorities. The local authorities don't sponsor visas, and perhaps the government can step in or some other authority, and that's something we can look at uh, as well. The final issue I just want to mention briefly is, of course, the Conservatives can help us with this debate if we're going to take a Team Scotland approach and deal with the poverty it's impacting on the classroom in Scotland. And, of course, the Education Committee is looking at the impact of poverty on educational attainment at the moment. And many of the witnesses, indeed all of the witnesses, uh, who have spoken about it have cited the UK government's welfare reform programme as damaging people's educational opportunities in our schools. And it's leading to a huge burden for our teachers, our schools, the education budget, our local authorities and the Scottish government. So I would ask, in closing, that the Scottish Conservatives look at this in the whole so we can give the best future to young people of Scotland. Alison Harris, followed by George Adam. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and may I say at the outset that I consider this to be a very important debate, a debate which has rightly been the subject of much discussion in the education world. Indeed, subject choice is a matter increasingly raised with me by constituents. So too is the issue of career guidance in our schools. Subject choice is crucial when it comes to the future career paths of our young people. Don't get me wrong, many schools do an excellent job in this respect, but we also know that a sizeable minority of schools are not providing our young people and pa their parents with everything they need to know. Professor Jim Scott's work has uncovered a worrying picture that over a third of schools are not adhering to the Scottish Government's guidelines to local authorities when it comes to the comprehensive details surrounding the column structures offered on their curriculum. And that is surely a matter which we need to address and with some urgency. But let me deal with the specific issue of the Curriculum for Excellence. It was intended to build upon the traditional broad education for which Scotland was long renowned. Instead, however, as a lack of the joined-up approach between S1 and 3 and then the senior phase, 
It has, perhaps unwittingly, narrowed subject choice in S4. And with particular concerns for those pupils who are leaving school at the end of S4 or at the end of S5 with passes at only NAT5. If their subject choice is restricted, they leave with fewer qualifications. Mm -hmm. This, con this concern that this might happen was flagged up in the early stages of the Curriculum for Excellence development and it certainly manifested itself on a practical level six years ago when parents in Aberdeenshire complained about what was happening in some schools. A recently retired head teacher wrote to one of my colleagues last week after First Minister's questions to say he knew at first hand what the slow erosion of subject choice was doing and he particularly singled out the effect on modern languages citing the case of how few pupils sat higher German this year. <coughs> Professor Jim Scott's recent report showed that in the past year alone, the number of schools offering just six subjects at S4 has increased from 45 to 57%. Only 32% allow children to sit seven subjects and just 11% offer eight. The consequence of this does not stop at S4, but it's having a knock-on effect on what subjects are available at higher and advanced higher. And the severity of that problem is felt in some of the most disadvantaged communities. It is shocking that if you go to a school in one of the wealthiest parts of Scotland, you've got a 70% chance of being able to choose between 12 and more advanced hires. Yet there are just two schools in the poorest parts of Scotland that pupils can choose between that number. 89% of schools surveyed say difficulties recruiting teachers constrain subject choice. The fact that the Scottish Government's own statistics show that there has been a 13% decline in secondary school teachers over the past 10 years speaks for itself. In priority STEM subjects, including maths, several councils have been unable to fill teacher posts, resulting in whole courses and subjects being dropped. But let me conclude on the issue of careers guidance. It is absolutely essential that careers guidance is well informed and thorough, most especially when many pupils are facing fewer subjects to choose from. It would be I would be very interested to know what assurances the Cabinet Secretary can give us that career guidance will in fact improve. Advice has not been provided on a universal basis, which, when compounded with more restrictive subject choice in S4 and a teacher shortage, is a major worry. And this is why I support the motion in the name of Liz Smith. The last of the open debate contributions is from George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. This is a very important debate and one that I'm glad to take part in. And at the beginning, I'd like to say that I agree with Richard Lockhead, my colleague, when he says that you know, let's not measure young people or schools' success on the number of hires they have in their hand. It's about the destination, the development and where they actually end up as time goes on. But this debate is one we've had in various guises over the years in uh, my time in the Education Committee, and that in itself is no bad thing, because it shows how serious we all are about this subject. But I would like to take this opportunity to talk about what actually is happening in our communities, because all in all, it is a positive story. Things are improving, but I'm not for one minute saying that everything is perfect. There is always scope to be better and do better, but the facts speak for themselves. More young people than ever before are leaving school with marketable, reputable and well-respected qualifications. And that is a testament to our education system and our teachers. Importantly, more young people from our most deprived communities are gaining higher and advanced hires and moving on to positive destinations. Indeed, the number of students from Scotland's most deprived areas gaining a university place reached a record high of 4,150 after results day last year. This is an increase of 680 students on the last two years alone. With numbers like that clearly laid out, I find it absolutely fascinating that we continue to talk down the Scottish education system and from then to suggest that pupils achieve in spite of the system, not because of it. We all know our teachers work exceptionally hard to make sure that every student in Scotland, irrespective of their background or postcode, can reach their full potential and gain the necessary qualifications to move on to their college, university or employment choice. In my own constituency alone, the area has a huge diversity. Over 92% of school leavers are going into positive destinations. And I've personally met and spoken with many of the students who are the first in their family to attend university. 
The young people I've had the pleasure of chatting to when I'm out and about in the constituency have never once suggested that they've achieved what they have in spite of the education system. Quite the opposite is true. Most Paisley students have nothing but good things to say about their school experience. I admit there's always many challenges for us all to face and we'll continue to face them, but I think everyone in here wants their children and young people to be happy in school and leave with a breadth of depth of knowledge that will give them the best possible start in life. So it goes without saying that we all want our young people to have the widest possible choice of subjects and classes. It is for these reasons that the Scottish Government is encouraging schools not only to be flexible in their timetabling, but to look at options to give students choices beyond their own school walls. Last, session, education last session's Education Committee, we visited a number of schools that embraced that flexibility and timetabling, and they explained to us what a difference it, marked difference it made in the school. And these were schools that were uh, in an area of uh, some of the areas of deprivation and challenges that they had there as well. And they told us that when they got that opportunity, they could make that difference. So currently, there are many, uh, a number of very good examples of schools being flexible and looking out, uh, for outside options. We've already heard about the higher hub at Glasgow Caledonian University and the virtual school network in the Highland Council area. These are real examples of how this government is encouraging our local authorities to widen the curriculum and allow students to make early connections with further education institutions. Presiding officer, it is only right that we debate this issue due to the fact that it is very important to every single one of us here. There is nothing more important than creating opportunities for our children and young people. But I think while we have this debate, we have to look to the future. But let's not forget that progress has and is being made. We move to the closing speeches and we are tight for time. It may affect the next debate. I call Mary Fee up to four minutes, please. Officer, can I begin by thanking the Conservatives for bringing this debate to the Chamber today, allowing us to debate the choices available to children and young people to allow them to follow whatever path they may choose. And it's also an opportunity to discuss the attainment gap, as we have recognised in our amendment, which I would ask the Chamber to support tonight. In their opening speeches in this debate, both Liz Smith and Ian Gray very clearly laid out the concerns over the narrowing of curricular choice and the impact that that has on attainment, particularly in relation to language and STEM. And the issue around language, as highlighted by Ian Gray, is a long-standing one with a huge drop in pupils pursuing a career in language. Again, of huge concern, as highlighted again by Ian Gray, is the rise in pupils leaving school with no qualifications at all. Lack of curricular choice is also exacerbated by where you live, with many rural schools being disadvantaged. Claire Adamson spoke about curriculum for excellence being pupil-based and pupil-focused. Limiting choice doesn't support pupils, it disadvantages them. Since 2007, as Liz Smith said, we have lost nearly 3,500 teachers. We've also lost teaching assistants, with literacy and numeracy rates falling and the attainment gap rising. Jenny Mara spoke of situations where PEF funding is used to mitigate cuts to core funding. And the First Minister has asked to be judged on her education record. And I do hope that she and the Education Secretary will take on board the very legitimate concerns of MSPs across this chamber and the concerns of teachers, pupils and parents. Presiding officer, limiting subject choice limits opportunity. Children in S4 should not have the paths that life can offer them narrowed at such a young age. Of course, we want children to achieve the best qualifications but it is short-sighted to limit the subject choice in order to glorify exam outcomes. We welcome the recognition by the Education Secretary that the attainment gap needs addressed. However, we need wide-reaching solutions and investment to match those solutions in order to tackle the stubborn gap. The attainment gap in our schools will not vanish or reduce with one single fix. PEF funding is an important tool but is not available in every school. And where it is, evidence would suggest that schools need better support and better guidance in how to best use the funding to close the attainment gap. In the long term, limiting subject choice, as our amendment highlights, particularly for schools in the poorest areas, will harm any attempts to reduce the attainment gap 
as well as limiting the opportunities for many to attend university after leaving school. Local authorities need security of funding to recruit more teachers on a permanent basis. Only then can we offer pupils more choices in what to study in order for each pupil to go on to pursue whatever career path they wish. All of our young people, regardless of what school they attend or where they live, should have the same choice, the same opportunity and the same support. Aspiration cannot and should not be limited by the choices that are available. Scottish education has traditionally been well respected across the UK and abroad. Given the scale of cuts and the damage done to schools and the limiting of subject choice, the First Minister and the Education Secretary are presiding over an education system which will lose respect of its teachers, of the pupils and of parents. And in closing, presiding officer, we in Scottish Labour want to work with the First Minister and the Education Secretary to ensure that education in Scotland remains as revered as it, as it always was and it always should be. Thank you. Shirley Ann Somerville, up to five minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. This afternoon's debate has focused on the issue of choice, highlighting the importance of ensuring that young people have a range of options available to them and are well supported in making the decisions that are right for them. As the Deputy First Minister highlighted in his opening speech, these are central themes of the report of the Learner Journey Review that was published on the 10th of May. Tavish Scott, when he spoke, asked for a considered way forward, and I would suggest that the Learner Journey Review does exactly that um, on this and many other is uh, issues. It's informed by the views of partners across the education and skills system, but perhaps more importantly in this year of young people, by the views of young people themselves. And those young people have made it clear that in order to ensure that they have the right access to choices that are right for them, we need to strike the right balance and blend of learning options in the post-15 education and skills system, a parity of esteem across the whole system. So we are equally clear that every young person has a right to effective guidance, advice and support so they can make sure they're making the right decisions about their learning and career pathways. The first of the uh, themes within the Learner Journey Review is around the need for better um, advice and guidance. And I would point uh, to the Learner Journey Review, particularly to Alison Harris when she spoke about that, because that is an integral theme of the entire um, year-long process we've been through. It talks about the connection between guidance that young people receive on subject choices, but on, also on their longer-term career options. And in progressing this priority, we will be undertaking work to map the availability of advanced higher provision across Scotland. That will help fulfil our commitment to provide practitioners, parents, carers and learners with access to an online prospectuses, setting out the learner choices available in their region, building on a one-stop shop approach. And I think this again deals with some of the points that Ross Greer and other speakers um, mentioned during the debate around the challenges in some areas, particularly rural areas, in the breadth of curriculum. Because the Learner Journey Review does exactly what Mr Greer asked us to do, to look at the barriers that need to be addressed to ensure that all schools and councils are being innovative and providing greater choices within their area. John Scott. Thank um, the Minister for taking in intervention. But with S4 places down by 150,000 since 2016, college places down by 150,000 since 2006, teacher numbers down by 3,400, teacher salaries down by 20%. Would the Minister agree with me that you don't need to look for complicated reasons when these simple reasons exist, that educational attainment and achievement in the broadest sense is falling across Scotland? Shirley Ann Somerville. The member won't be surprised to know that I utterly disagree with that assessment of the education system. Taking two points off that, he talks about the college places. I'm not going to apologise for the fact that we've actually developed college places that are based on recognised qualifications leading to employment. And the discussions around what happens within in S4 really do lack an understanding that S4 is the start of the learner's journey in the senior phase. That is what Curriculum for Excellence is all about. It focuses on the learner's total achievement. It focuses on that three-year progression through that senior phase. And I'm sorry if Mr Scott doesn't understand the basis for which Curriculum for Excellence was brought in. Now, the second priority that we will look in within the learner journey 
is to ensure that more choice is provided through work-based learning opportunities. We want to be able to provide that balance of work-based and academic skills that will, inform by, um, that will be informed by employer engagement. We want to see those opportunities uh, that members spoke about around foundation apprenticeships, for example, to be driven as a, as a good destination for our young people, as well as the needs for the Scottish economy. Thirdly, we want to improve the alignment of courses between schools, colleges, apprenticeships and universities so that young people are able to progress through the post-15 education system as smoothly and effective as possible. Presiding officer, I do believe that the Learner Journal Review, which we have undertaken within the government, does echo many of the themes that have emerged in this afternoon's debate. Liz Smith mentioned in her opening remarks around the purpose of S6, and this is dealt with very clearly within the Learner Journey Review. It also looks at the point around informal learning, which Tavish Scott um, um, brought up, and I would be happily um, agree with him on that, and the government is working to ensure that there is more recognition of informal learning, um, dealing particularly with some of the points that Ian Gray made in a previous um, discussion and debate around the Year of Young People. Presiding officer, there is a need for, to provide young people with better advice, more opportunities and coherent routes to education. The attainment gap is closing. The government is continuing with more work to do on that, but we are proud of our work on this agenda so far. I call Oliver Mundell to close this debate for up to six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Clearly, the minister was listening to a different debate uh, to the one that took place because very little in those remarks touched on the core issues uh, that were brought forward as part of this motion, nor did they really uh, connect with the many points that came from different members uh, from different parties across this chamber talking about their own experience and talking about the very substantial evidence uh, that was forensically laid out uh, by my colleague Liz Smith at the start of this debate. And this does matter. It matters because no task is more important for this parliament than ensuring our young people get the best start in life, ensuring that they're fully equipped for the challenges of the future and ready to contribute uh, to uh, and lead in our society. Subject choice, and I stress the importance of the word choice, lies right at the heart of making good on this promise. Yeah. I may be young enough uh, to still remember how important these decisions are in an ever-changing world where people's career opportunities change several times across their lifetime. And I think that people should continue to benefit from the same opportunities I enjoyed and many other members across this chamber will have enjoyed too. We talk about curriculum for excellence as being about empowering the individual learner, giving them more input into their own education. It's surely then quite ironic, as we've heard today, that the reality of the new curriculum for many young people in Scotland is that less choice than ever before exists at a crucial juncture. And I find it astonishing uh, to hear the Cabinet Secretary try and claim that this was an intentional uh, consequence. Clearly, like Claire Adamson, he doesn't remember uh, what Fiona Hislop, the then uh, Cabinet Secretary, had to say to Parliament back in 2009, when she said, and I quote, I want to see the breadth of experience in S4. There are some misplaced concerns that there will be restrictions. <laughs> She goes on to say, I will not accept a situation in which there are restrictions. Now we see detailed evidence laid out over a period of time uh, that show that there has been restrictions and there's no getting away from that. As we've heard uh, from across the chamber, there's no doubt that that problem is confounded uh, and uh, comes about in many cases because of teacher shortages and vacancies, uh, particularly in STEM subjects. Um, and that, that, that's just not good enough. Uh, we've, we, we know there's a problem there, yet the action to fix it is painfully slow. And I agree with the Cabinet Secretary, many of the curriculum choices uh, should be decided at school level. We think that's a good idea. We think it enhances the system. But how can we possibly expect that a broad range of subjects will be on offer uh, when a number of schools don't even have the teachers to teach them? Yep. Alex Rowley. Thank you for giving way, and I do accept that part of the reason for the restriction in the number of courses, certainly in five schools, is down to uh, a, a lack of teachers, particularly in STEM subjects, but part of it is also down to budget. Does he accept that, and does he accept that failed 
austerity coming from the Westminster government is contributing to this problem. Oliver Mundell. I, I, I don't accept the point the member makes. The Scottish Government has got more money uh, to spend than ever before, and it's political choices made in this Parliament uh, that are having an effect on our young people. And I think it's time to recognise that fact, and the SNP Government should stop hiding uh, behind other people's... So, and I, I think to be fair, uh, actually, if uh, the Cabinet Secretary wants to stop shouting, uh, Richard, 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 Richard Lockhead actually gave a far more considered and reasonable speech on these points, highlighting some of the issues we do face in rural areas. And I would certainly very much welcome uh, more research into the causes of that, looking at my own constituency. And you know, from the general reaction, it's, it, it's easy to understand uh, why throughout this debate the SNP government have sought to muddy the waters and talk about a different issue. The Cabinet Secretary doesn't want to talk about choice and I can give him a few uh, practical examples. Just last week I visited Langham Academy in my own constituency and the one issue that pupils chose uh, to raise with me was the fact that they weren't able to take uh, the subjects that they wanted. Uh, they were in a position because not of availability but because uh, of being reduced to six subjects that they weren't able to take uh, both history and chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, one uh, young person uh, felt that he loved history. Yep. Uh, John Swinney. I'm grateful to Mr Mundell for giving way. Cite an example in Langham Academy. Now, if we were to follow the view of the world that Mr Mundell views about choice being available to schools, if a school decided, like Langham Academy, to have uh, a particular level of choice available to young people, what would Mr Mundell do about that if he disagreed with it? Would he accept the right of the school to set that or would he just come here and complain about something that he approves of in principle? Oliver Mundell. I, I think that's a complete mischaracterisation of the situation because in fact uh, teachers at Langham Academy support the view of pupils. They would like to see a broader range of subject choices but they don't have enough teachers uh, to deliver them. And secondly, uh, they're, they're being directed by the local authority and they feel uh, as clearly a significant number of schools do now over 50% uh, that they're being directed and pushed uh, towards just six subjects. That hasn't happened by accident. It's not a school level choice. This is a systematic problem across the whole of Scottish education and it's about time the Cabinet Secretary took that seriously. You must I'll give close, him, please. I'll, I can end um, on that point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mundell. That concludes the debate on education subject choices. And it's time to move on to the next item of business. We are short of time, so if you could uh, shuffle around quickly, it would be appreciated. <laughs>